everybody. Welcome to ICC's Game of the Week with your host as always, Joel Benjamin. This week we will look at a shocker from the Women's World Championship in Sochi. Indian GM Humpy Canero came out of the gate in dominant fashion, winning her first three matches with a 2-0 whitewash. In the absence of longtime rival Ho Yifan, she seemed poised to take the title, if only until a title defense against Ho. But her hopes were shattered by the other Muzashuk girl. Anna Muzashuk, who represents Slovenia, has been in the top handful of women players for years, but now her little sister Maria is making a statement. 22-year-old Maria, who has raised her rating close to her big sister's, stunned Canero in the first game with a blitzkrieg attack. Canero would retaliate in game two before falling victim to a swindle in the decisive playoff game. Amuzashuk went on to defeat Harika in the, in the fifth round after surviving a lost queen ending in the playoff. Maria Amuzashuk must be living right, though don't be surprised if she isn't invited to India. Okay, let's ha- have a look at this game. It's, uh, it's that dramatic uh, game one of the match. Muzashuk playing white. And it's going to be a scotch opening. And now bishop c5. Uh, there are two main moves here. The other one is knight f6, which uh, tends to lead to great complications after the trade, and then e5, and queen e7, queen e2. Um, we sometimes see queenside castling, very, very sharp positions. Uh, you generally have to know a lot of theory to play those well. So bishop c5 is a, is a little bit more low-key. It's not as uh, complicated and theory-driven, uh, but it's it's also a very main move. Uh, in in uh, Game of the Week, we've also seen a few games with the bishop b4 check, and then after c3, the bishop can retreat to c5 or, or e7. Now, after bishop c5, there are three main possibilities. Uh, Musa Shuk plays bishop e3, which is kind of the old main move. There's also knight takes c6, which is the move that uh, Kasparov uh, used to, to reinvigorate the Scotch several years ago, followed by, uh, after queen f6, going queen d2 to defend the mate. Uh, and there were also, um, many years later, uh, in recent times, players have tried queen f3 as well. But um, this line has really kind of, the, the enthusiasm for this line has really kind of died down. Uh, it leads to a lot of endings, which are, kind of unexceptional. So knight takes c6, which can, went out from obscurity to the main line, has really kind of gone to the, onto the back burner. Uh, meanwhile, a move which is which has almost been uh, discarded for a number of years, knight b3 has suddenly become very popular among grandmasters in the last few years. And that's with bishop b6, knight c3, and one of the main differences in the old games, white used to follow up with a4 to try to harass the bishop. And uh, now nobody does that because white's big idea is to castle queenside. That's making the best use of the d4 break. And so after knight f6, and black can also play d6 or knight g7, the idea is they're going queen e2, followed by bishop e3 and, and queenside castling. We see a lot of games at the grandmaster level. So then there's bishop e3, and of course, if you're black, uh, like I said, it's it's not maybe not as theory driven or as complicated as knight f6, but it's a little tr- bit tricky, and you have to be on the ball from the beginning because white is now threatening knight takes c6, winning a piece. So consequently, black usually plays queen f6. Uh, th- there is a, a kind of um, uh, simpler alternative here to, to playing queen f6 and putting the piece on, on somewhat unusual squares. That's black can retreat bishop b6 and then just bring the knight to f6, which hasn't been tried all that much. White is usually able to maintain uh, a space advantage, but 
you know, it's a relatively solid move. Okay, so we see queen f6, and white defends the knight with c3, knight g7, and now Musa Shuk plays g3, which she has generally done in this position. Uh, somewhat more popular here is the move bishop c4, and there's many ways that the game can, can go from there. Um, one of the problems with bishops uh, going to c4, it's not entirely secure on this square, as in a lot of variations, black will attack it with knight e5, which is even possible right away, and in some cases the bishop ends up retreating to e2, uh, possibly because uh, in, in some cases... Uh, knight g4 can, can be otherwise available to attack the bishop on e3. But the bishop on c4 does at least discourage black from playing d5. After g3, there is no such restriction, and thus d5 is the move that's, that's usually played. Uh, but as I was researching, I found that there are a lot of games where black hasn't played d5, and the most interesting alternative is the move h5, which actually has been played by a whole bunch of grandmasters. Uh, whenever I, I, I look up these openings and I check the, the, the database, I'm always a little bit surprised to find some things. Uh, for instance, uh, players like Kramnik have gone with this h5. And because h4 is a bit, bit of a positional threat, um, white usually plays h3, and then black can follow up with h4 and uh, then knight g6 and try to play in the dark squares. So that's, that's a way that black can, can play this variation if he or she, in this case, does not want to get uh, dull equality, um, which might come out of this move d5, uh, as uh, after the, those pawns are exchanged, it's a, a position with, without um, without so much structure in it. But uh, Canero, uh, looking at her games from the, from the the, the uh, first few matches, she would of course get off to a good start by winning the first, and then the second game she would often play, you know, a little bit conservatively, but still playing playing for the win without any risk. So um, she's usually comfortable in such a situation. All right, bishop g2, d takes e4, castles. Uh, white can also play knight d2 first. It's probably going to come out to be the same thing. Castles, knight d2. So we see that white can s still create some problems for black as white is getting ready to recapture the pawn uh, and harass these two pieces. So black has to get something out of the way. And... Canera plays the usual move, bishop b6. Um, there's also bishop takes d4. This move is somewhat less popular. White takes back, and the queen goes. Knight takes e4. Here, bishop takes e4, bishop f5, at least nothing. Knight takes e4. And in this position, okay, white has an isolated d pawn, which is not always weak in the middle game. In this case, the two bishops really count for something. Um, if the light squared bishops disappeared from the board, uh, white could actually run into some trouble, but it's, it's not so easy for black to manage that as this knight is getting ready to jump into c5, and there is a fair bit of pressure on the c-file. So, uh, for the most part, in practice, we've seen black just to stay the course with bishop b6, and did not, not give up the bishop pair. Okay, now we see rook e1, and this is an attempt at a refinement in the move order. Um, it's also possible to play knight takes e4, queen g6, rook e1. But one difference is that there, black can play bishop to g4, um, and this is a possibility that uh, Canero does not have in the game, and that move is somewhat annoying for white, doesn't really want to play f3, weakening move, and if the queen moves, black has kind of gained a tempo to get, to get her forces into the game. Now, uh, instead of um, rook e1 in uh, this position, um, there have been several other moves played, and, and the one move that the computer liked is a very odd-looking move that uh, most people wouldn't consider at first, but 
worth pointing out, knight to c5, kind of cool. Uh, it's not really hanging because bishop takes c5, white can counter with knight takes c6, and bishop takes e3, definitely out of the question because of a fork, and otherwise white is poised to take back this bishop on c5 with a good position. So most of the games after knight c5, black has um, uh, taken on d4, and gone again for this isolated pawn position. In this case, white does not have the bishop pair. And, uh, okay, my chess engine like this very much for white, but I, I suppose that it's, we could say it's pretty much a normal position out of the opening with chances for both sides. So one point of rookie one is that black cannot just try to get that position with bishop g4 because after queen g6, white will take on e4 with the bishop with gain of time. And because the, the exchange in d4 hasn't happened yet, now bishop f5 is, is not a good move as white can, can um, take it with the, with the knight and, and create a pin. Um, f5 is a weakening move and otherwise black will have to lose more time moving the queen again. So, by playing rookie one first, black is sidestepping that, uh, sorry, white is sidestepping a certain possibility. But on the other hand, um, it's perfectly fine for black just to, to take here on d4 as well. Knight takes e4. And now queen f5. So, this is the extra possibility that black gains from this move order. Because if white had taken uh, on e4 on move 11, this would not be possible. It would be a knight sitting on d4. Now, there aren't too many games with queen f5, but I did find one game that Leko defended against, I believe it was Ivanchuk, and he put the queen on g6, and then he moved it to f5 almost immediately, which seems puzzling. But anyway, it's an argument for going queen f5. All right, so bishop takes d4, knight c6, get, getting to a safe square, takes doubles the pawns, but opens up the A-file, and that gives black a little bit of pressure, which is probably going to, at minimum, gain some time for her. And now, F4. Well, uh, after this move, we seem to have a new position, uh, but there's only been a handful of games from here, and no Grandmaster tests. Queen D2 has been played before. Um, well, what can you say about F4? It takes away the e5 square from the knight, which is useful, and obviously prepares uh, to run the pawns forward on the king side, which is going to be significant in this game, as as we see. But it's also a little bit weakening, and at this point, it seems that black should be should be able to deal with it okay. But do note that black basically doesn't have any pieces on the king side whereas white has bishop here and this knight in the region, and that is going to be a factor. Um, that's important part of attacking play and defensive play is to be very aware of the, the numbers game, of the number of attackers and defenders in the region of the king. Okay, so bishop e6, attacking the pawn on uh, a3, and... Okay, the safest way to deal with the queen side is to play a3, and that way, okay, white is not going to run into tr any trouble of losing any pawns on the queen side in the near future, but it, it doesn't help really control any light squares. So Mus Musashuk plays b3, and even though that leaves the a pawn as more of a target, she is restricting squares of the bishop on e6, and looking to, to maybe uh, attack that, knight g5 is, is in the air. And as we shall see, also kind of distracting black into going after those queenside pawns and maybe leaving her king vulnerable. Okay, so h6 to cover that knight g5 and make luft a useful move, but also, as we shall see, presents a target to open up lines. h3, which also makes luft, but... Uh, mainly prepares this idea of g4, and we see potential pawn storm. And it's a, that's actually a pretty creative idea by Musashuk. Um, I, I don't know if white has played in this type of manner in, in similar positions, but it is a, a really uh, interesting and, and challenging idea. 
I mean, at first, it doesn't look so great because after rook a3, black is getting stuff going on the queen side immediately. Queen d2, and now queen a5. So we see the queen gravitate to the queen side. But on the other hand, g4 is coming anyway. We're just going to chase the queen away. So uh, the black queen couldn't really stay where it was. Um, but there's a serious threat here. Bishop takes b3. The queen side is kind of falling apart. And, well, Muzishuk's strategy is not to make weaknesses and then grimly defend them. Her idea is to, to get some active play going. And if she has to give something up, to get something going. So there, so she starts with b4. That pawn was going to be taken if it didn't move. Obviously, the a pawn looks like a dead duck now, but she's prepared to sacrifice it, g4. So, Canera plays rook d8, uh, which chases the queen, actually, to f2, which is a good attacking position. Uh, so in hindsight, you say, well, Shouldn't black have just taken on a2 directly? Well, one issue with that is that here white can actually just go for an ending with f5, tagging the bishop. Trade, knight takes. Now the bishop doesn't, doesn't have any really nice squares. Bishop a2 is not a really good place to go, so the bishop has to go to a passive square. And then after, let's say, knight c4, we see that uh, black's extra pawn isn't really making a huge impression here as it's doubled and white has a lot of space and real nice activity. Uh, so, you know, obviously this is an opportunity to, for black to play in a much safer way. But, um, you know, the reason why you often see very strong players get, uh, get gunned down by vicious attacks early in the game is because along the way they pass up safer opportunities because they wanted more out of the position. And here, uh, Canera probably saw this possibility and decided, you know, white will be okay. So she plays rook d8, queen f2, and now grabs his pawn at a2. Rook takes. And now black has a decision to, to take with the queen or the bishop, and Canero ends up taking with the bishop, which might look surprising at first uh, because queen takes, picks up a tempo on the queen. But there is some argument for it because, first of all, the bishop gets out of the way of an f5 tempo. And secondly, black preserves this possibility of rook d1 to trade rooks. Nevertheless, it might have been a better idea to, to, to go with queen takes a2. After queen h4, I mean, queen h2 doesn't exactly win a tempo because queen h4, the queen comes to a nice attacking position, hitting the rook on d8 and kind of creating a threat of b5 uh, as well as a threat of f5, and this might have dissuaded Canero from, uh, from queen takes a2. But black can play queen b3 here, which both covers b5 and also sets up this rook d1 idea again. So one possible variation, which is a little wild, is uh, g5 here. Uh, white can also play f5, but I don't know if I don't know if f5 is really going to get it done because black can play bishop d5 and, and chop off the knight. And uh, when that knight goes, not only that that white loses a lot of attacking potential, but also suddenly there's a lot more avenues into her king as well. So I think g5 would actually be the move. And we could see hg, knight takes g5, looking to get into h7, bishop f5, and now, cool variation, knight takes f7. Okay, reopening this line towards the rook, and also looking to take the knight on c6. So after queen takes f7, bishop takes c6, Queen g6 check, bishop g2, probably rook d3 here. The position is approximately balanced. After rook d3, the best move computer gives a very slight edge to black, but uh, we see even pawns and obviously a game that could go either way. 
thing about such a position is that uh, I think that white has really huge practical advantage because uh, in, in all these variations, white always has attacking chances and black has to be careful in defense. Whereas uh, if black makes a mistake, things can go horribly wrong and that's kind of what we're going to see here. But Muzashuk, I think, plays a pretty clever move here. And it's b5. She, she attacks his knight. A little dilemma for black, where to go? Well, it seems like, of course, black can't take the pawn because the bishop on a2 will hang. Seems like knight e7 makes the most sense. And Canera did not play this, I suspect, because she didn't like the idea that white could play... Um, f5 and then threaten to play f6 and, and bust open the um, king side. I don't think it's because of knight f6 check because even though that opens up the king it doesn't necessarily open open up the king in a way that, that you can get to it after queen a3 um, attacking the rook, hitting the pawn on c3 also idea of queen c1 and rook d2 with a counter attack it uh, becomes clear that maybe white's king is actually more vulnerable than black's because these, the, the pawn structure, as ugly as it is, is actually keeping white pieces out. So I don't think knight f6. I think f5 was what worried Canero with that pawn coming to f6. But uh, black could play rook d1. Generally a good idea to reduce the number of attacking pieces. f6 and... I'm not sure where the knight should go, whether d5 or g6. Let's say g6. Um, f takes g6, and there's a whole host of possibilities. Maybe black would just recapture the pawn. And, well, I mean, black is, black is holding, um, not necessarily winning a uh, pawn up. It's not really a great extra pawn at the moment, and also the king is exposed. So it's a position where... Yeah, black is okay, but again, uh, Canero would want more than this because the upside is not necessarily that great. And um, you know, with the king exposed, you know, it's, it may it may actually be easier to play for white. But uh, the knight going to the a file is certainly very risky, and we see knight a seven. So. Very ambitious move, really, that maybe the knight is just going to take and get back in. And black preserves this rook d1. And so it seems like black really hasn't done anything wrong in this game. Has played very logical moves, developed pieces, took advantage of weaknesses on the queen side. But nevertheless, we get to this position, we see one, two, three pieces lined up on the A file. Now, it's not that black is going to lose anything there, and, and do note that rook A1 is, is, is never a problem because of, of rook D1 check, so black is not in danger of losing anything on the, the queen side. But there's zero defenders on the king side, and you look at the white forces, they are concentrated on that side of the board. White has a huge number numbers advantage on the king side, and that means... The white has possibility for kingside attack. It's almost always going to be that way when you have, you know, four attackers against pretty much nothing. So here we go. Attack begins with uh, with g5. Now, objectively, uh, black is okay here, but the pressure is all on her to find a defense. Okay, so Canero plays h takes g5. This move is okay. Maybe, maybe even best. Uh, I would say the main alternative is rook d1, again, looking to trade. We could see g takes h6. Take back. I don't think black has anything better. King h2. Okay, now the white queen is free to move around. Now, one somewhat funny variation is, is bishop b1, knight f6 check, king g7, knight e8 check, King f8, knight takes c7. And now the knight is 
we see the knight really being a problem on a7, and the, the b6 pawn is hanging. Queen back to d6, knight d5. And after a while, we start to get this position where black is very uncoordinated. The piece is just not working at all. Knight a3 and c4, opening up the queen and threatening queen h8 mate. And in this position, black technically a pawn up, but the piece is all strewn about, the king exposed, and white has a huge, maybe decisive advantage here. Okay, so black didn't have to play bishop b1. Let's go back to that position. Okay, instead of bishop b1, we could see bishop c4. And now maybe queen h4. Now the position gets very hard to analyze. Um, even with the computer, there's a whole lot of moves that are um, a, a similar, lead to a similar score. Black is probably going to have to give up the h pawn, um, you know, something like like king f8 just to shed the pawn might be might be possible but it seems like it's it's a fairly balanced position but again with white having attacking chances in the king probably more pleasant to play right? it's not entirely uh pleasant a pleasant option but uh basically canero just wants too much from the position and that is what becomes her leads to her undoing. She really underestimates uh, the potential of, of Musa Shuk's attack here. Now, after HG, knight takes g5, the knight covers this square. Uh, one idea is that white might play queen h4 to get there with the queen, but also the king now does not have luft, so there's a back, back rank weakness, and that becomes a huge factor. Basically, there's only one follow-up to this hg5, and black must play rook d1 here to trade that rook. Now, perhaps this might be counterintuitive for some because you have a back rank weakness, so you leave the back rank with your, <laughs> with your only defender. But you, by getting rid of the rook, it means that white is left with just a queen, and the queen can only attack by, you know, from one direction, whereas white was threatened to come in with a rook, and the queen can also menace uh, penetration, let's say, on h7. So after, after rook d1, uh, a couple, let's look at a couple of possibilities. Bishop, let's say bishop f3, the forces exchange. So hard to tell exactly what the most accurate um, way to play. And, okay, we'll look at a couple of lines. One, queen takes b5, guarding the mate on, on e8. I mean, of course, this looks a little precarious. It's, you know, not necessarily um, intuitive uh, play for black. Okay, queen takes b5, queen d2, trying to get in again. Queen c5, king g2. Queen a3, attacking the bishop. Okay, that's a bit a, a bit of a, a bit of a computer move, but. Uh, if the bishop goes to c4, white would have an idea to play queen d8 and queen takes c7, attacking the bishop, so kind of keeping it out of the way. Queen d8, queen f8, queen takes c7, knight b5. And now we could see basically a lot of liquidation coming down to a position with just two pawns for each side and a likely draw. Okay, so let's go back to this position where we played queen takes b5. Another move black could play is queen a3. Again, with the defense here. Queen f8. Queen e4. Queen c5 check. King g2. Bishop c4. Queen takes b7. This is kind of the long way around. Knight takes b5, but it comes out the same thing. Queen a8 check, queen f8, queen e4. Well, White could have done this earlier as well. Queen c5. Okay, this mate threat here, and the bishop is attacked. So kind of unusual repetition we can see back and forth like this with the draw. 
So Canero obviously would have considered Rook D1 and uh, probably felt that um, she doesn't really have good uh, kingside defenses and that White will either get some kind of repetition or will be able to grab queenside pawns and uh, maybe it's not that dangerous, but um, she's not going to win. So she played really the most optimistic move in the position, the, the most ideal move, F6, because if Black can chase away this knight, that would probably kill the attack, and then Rook D1 could happen, or, or Knight takes B5, and, and Black would be winning. It's the kind of thing where, as I said, it seems that Black hasn't made any mistakes, and White's play is... is White is played in a way that you know doesn't really have any kind of theoretical stamp of approval to it, um, and I think that uh, Canero really just underestimated what uh, Musa Shuk was up to, and now she pays for it because White hits with Queen D2, and this, this move is just absolutely devastating. It shows graphically the weakness of the back rank. And uh, really kind of surprising that a player of uh, Canero's stature missed it. Um, that's why everyone has to have a healthy sense of danger. That when you, when you see a move that seems to solve all your problems, some, sometimes you have to take a second look. You know, maybe your opponent is really up to something. As long as that knight sits on g5, it creates a back rank. So this move is just devastating because black obviously can't take the queen because of rookie eight mate. But uh, also, the black pieces all lined up on the A file can, can offer no help in defense at all. So now basically, white is going to attack the, the, uh, the king with the, the rook desperately trying to defend but really not offering um, much at all. So basically now, we're, we're, we're looking at force mates from here. Okay, Canero played rook f8, which makes about the most sense. If rook goes to a different square, we could see finishes like this. Bishop d5. Uh, anytime the king goes to the h file, queen e2 is uh, going, with, with queen h5 coming, is going to end things. So bishop takes d5, queen takes d5, King h8 forced. Knight f7 check. Now king g8 is an immediate mate by cutting off the rook to give the e8 square. So queen h5 and rook e8 mates. So black has to try king h7. Queen h5 check. King g8, knight h6. Uh, if the king goes to h8, knight f5 check, king g8, and uh, queen g6. It's most crushing. Black just doesn't have a way to defend g7. So go back to position after knight h6. Takes, queen g6, king h8. Well, there are many ways to finish off, but queen f6 would be the same if the king went to f8. King g8 forced, and now the uh, simplest is actually king h1. Rook e7 also wins, but this is simpler. Rook g1, it's over. Now, the move rook f8 didn't really change too much. Bishop d5. Again, king h8, queen e2, uh, coming to h5. And if g6, queen e7, it's just finito hitting the rook, hitting mate over here. Black takes, queen takes, king h8. And now white actually has several winning methods uh, in addition to the move played. Uh, she can again play knight f7 check, uh, which was we saw was good with the, with the rook on c8. Um, if, uh, if king g8, uh, in that case, we can see uh, knight d6 check, really looking at the f5 square, but leaving the h file open for this check, and now knight f8, knight f5. It looks like black has won a tempo on the other variation, <laughs> but the problem is that now knight e7 is, is a mate in one threat, and so black is uh, 
is really going to fall victim to the same kind of business before either 97 or, 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 or Queen G6 going to end the game. So if King H7, again, Queen H5, same tactics. Knight H6, pawn takes, uh, Queen G6 check, King H8, and then Rook E7 is good enough. Black uh, is going to basically run out of checks, and uh, then then can only uh, the king can can come up to H4. Black can only keep the game going for a few moves by by giving up the, giving away the queen. Also note that Rook G8 is not a defense here in any position because Rook H7 is made. So that that uh, is very convincing. Uh, queen f5, I think, is also a uh, calculatable um, force mate as well, threatening uh, h7, and uh, uh, pawn is, is, is pinned to uh, uh, because of the rook hangs, similar variations in the game. But uh, Musashuk uh, concludes in the prettiest, most thematic way with uh, queen f5, didn't take long on that, you know. You, you see, you see a killing move that uh, just offers no possibility of defense. You know, just just go with it. Don't mess around. And after that, um, Canero had to resign. Uh, not only the rook is is attacked, but there's also a threat of queen h5 and queen h7 mate. Rook takes queen, obviously, it, it is falls victim to not knight takes rook, of course, but rook e8 with a back rank mate. And uh, well, what else? If black takes the knight, queen takes rook, black is down the exchange, but gets worse because after queen f5, there's no way to avoid mate. Uh, the white rook is going to come in decisively to e6, e7, or e8, depending on whether black plays king h6, g6, or king back to the, to the back rank. But in any case, it's going to be checkmate. So a very... A uh, sudden debacle for Canero uh, after this move uh, f6. Uh, what looked like just just maybe some vague, vague attacking chances suddenly turned into a checkmate. But that is the kind of thing you really have to keep your eye on when you're losing the numbers game. When you have all your pieces on the queen side and your opponent has all of her pieces on the king side, uh, that kind of thing can happen in a hurry. So. Big win for for Musashuk. She actually did not win this match all that smoothly after that, but she did eventually get through. And also, uh, with with a good uh, bit of luck, uh, got through the semifinal. And now she's into the final against Poganina. Uh, certainly a dark horse final uh, that uh, very few people would have predicted. Uh, but uh, it should be an interesting one with. Uh, uh, with two uh, interesting young players who did not expect to be there. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. All right, that about does it. I'm Grandmaster Joel Benjamin. I hope you enjoyed that game, and I hope that you will join me next time on ICC's Game of the Week. Oh.